Welcome to another episode of China Update, where I provide you with the most up-to-date political, economic, and geostrategic analysis on the world's number two economy. My name is Tony. Let's jump in. Happy Saturday, everybody. I trust you're having a restful weekend. I'm feeling a little under the weather today, so my apologies in advance if my voice sounds a little off. I hope it is not too distracting. Let's begin. In a disappointment to many, hoping for optimistic news on the economic front, perhaps signs of some stabilization. On Thursday, new National Bureau of Statistics data showed consumer prices rose by a muted 0.1% in March from a year earlier, versus a 0.7% rise in February, which was the first gain in six months. More concerningly. Producer prices in March fell 2.8 percent year-on-year, widening a 2.7 percent slide the previous month, and extending a year and a half long stretch of declines. Zhang Jiawei, chief economist at Pinpoint Asset Management, expressed on the news, "Quote: China still faces the risk of deflation as domestic demand remains weak." End quote. He said the property slump continued in March. Fiscal spending had been weak, and export growth was not enough to boost the economy on its own. This is in contrast to the U.S., where inflation surprised on the upside. Zhang Jiawei observed, quote, "This indicates the monetary policy stances in these two countries may continue to diverge as well, indicating that the wide interest rate differential between them would persist, with implications for the renminbi." End quote. Next up, on Thursday, in a first, the U.S., Japan, and the Philippines held trilateral summit talks to discuss greater military and diplomatic coordination in the South China Sea and other theaters. The official statements were not shy in expressing who is the target of these efforts. The joint statement said that quote, we reiterate serious concern over the PRC's repeated obstruction of Philippine vessels' exercise of high sea freedom of navigation and the disruption of supply lanes to Second Thomas Shoal, which constitute dangerous and destabilizing conduct. The final and legally binding July 12, 2016, arbitral tribunal determined that this feature lies within the Philippines' exclusive economic zone, and we call on the PRC to abide by the ruling. End quote. The East China Sea and Taiwan were also discussed as well. At the summit, U.S. President Biden once again warned China about its activities in the region, expressing, quote, "I want to be clear: the United States' defense commitments to Japan and to the Philippines are ironclad. They are ironclad. Any attack on Philippine aircraft vessels or armed forces in the South China Sea would invoke our mutual defense treaty." End quote. Today, in response, Beijing's foreign ministry spokesperson once again blamed the United States and the Philippines for the tensions and for violating China's sovereignty. Meanwhile, we already covered Japanese Prime Minister Kishida's visit to Washington from earlier this week, which included the announcement of much closer bilateral military ties to respond to a rising Chinese assertiveness in the East and South China Seas. On Thursday, a PRC Ministry of Foreign Affairs spokesperson said that the U.S. and Japan quote have misrepresented the facts, violated China's sovereignty, and breached international law and basic norms in international relations. End quote. Adding that they pose quote the real threat end quote to regional peace and stability. Quote, Does anyone know which international law the U.S. and Japan have violated here? Beijing is unhappy because Japan has made a fundamental shift in its views of its security situation and needs. Mainly because of the trends accelerated by Xi Jinping, and that shift will constrain some of Beijing's options in the future, or at least make them much more expensive. End quote. Next up, as it's the weekend, we have a foreign policy heavy video, and we will move to a very busy week in Europe. China relations. If you're getting some value from today's episode, as always, it's a huge help if you can hit the like button. Subscribing is also a big help. Patreon and buy me a coffee links are also in the description below for those who want to help me keep the channel financially sustainable. As always, thank you so much, everybody, for the ongoing support. Next up, we have several Europe-China relations developments to cover. On Wednesday this week, the European Commission updated a report it made. Uh, in tw-、uh, in 2017, on state-induced distortions in China's economy, to quote the name of the report, adding new sections and potentially opening the door to anti-dumping complaints from EU chip and clean tech producers. The update, at 712 pages, adds details of what the EU executive considers to be distortions in sectors of. Telecom equipment, semiconductors, the rail industry, renewable energy, and electric vehicles. 
while I try to read all documents which we cover uh, on this uh, on this channel. 700 pages was quite long. As such, I could only really read the executive summary. UK-based Reuters writes that the report is a tool for EU industries to use when filing complaints about dumping practices. If Chinese prices and costs are found to be distorted, they can be replaced with those from another country to calculate normally higher dumping tariffs. Lauren Rusman, partner at trade firm Rusman Beck & Co., told Reuters, quote, This could be taken as an invitation to sectors that have not yet brought anti-dumping complaints to explore their use, end quote. This update's main findings focus on cross-cutting distortions, distortions in the factors of production such as discriminatory allocation and access to resources such as land, labor, raw minerals and energy, and distortions in selected sectors such as state support including preferential access to finance in specific industrial sectors. In response to the update, a PRC foreign ministry spokesperson expressed on Thursday, quote, China is highly concerned about the discriminatory measures taken by the EU against Chinese companies and even industries. The export of relevant products has made an important contribution to the global response to inflation and climate change. We hope that the EU will not undermine efforts to tackle climate change while vociferously advocating addressing the issue. End quote. Meanwhile, the EU will investigate subsidies received by Chinese suppliers of wind turbines destined for Europe in the bloc's latest move to shield domestic firms from cheap, clean tech products and part of the wider concern of Chinese overcapacity accusations. In a speech this week, the EU's antitrust commissioner, Vestager, announced that the EU will, quote, investigate subsidies received by Chinese suppliers of wind turbines destined for Europe. We saw the playbook for how China can dominate the solar panel industry. Nowadays, less than 3% of the solar panels installed in the EU are produced in Europe. We see this playbook now deployed across all clean tech areas, legacy semiconductors and beyond, as China doubles down on a supply-side support strategy to address its economic downturn. End quote. She also called for, quote, the US and EU to team up to reach a critical mass in the G7 and tackle the imbalances created by China's state capitalism more systematically. End quote. She also proposed establishing objective trustworthiness criteria for all critical industries, including clean technology, as the EU and US have already done for 5G vendors. Countries that don't meet the criteria would be excluded from certifications and government contracts. The European Commission will look into conditions for the development of wind parks in Spain, Greece, France, Romania and Bulgaria. In response to this news, the China Chamber of Commerce in the EU said in a statement, quote, This action sends a detrimental signal to the world, suggesting discrimination against Chinese enterprises and endorsing protectionism. End quote. Agatha Demarius, a senior policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations, called this move, quote, a wake-up call about the consequences of China's industrial overcapacity for Europe's competitiveness. End quote. Adding that the clean tech is, quote, a key battleground in the conflict between China and Western countries for economic dominance. End quote. Meanwhile, this week saw the publication of a report called China's Massive Subsidies for Green Technologies by German-based Kiel Institute, K-I-E-L. The report argues that Beijing heavily subsidizes its domestic industries, particularly in sectors such as green technologies like electric mobility or wind power. Estimates suggest that China's overall subsidies range between three to nine times that of other OECD countries such as the USA or Germany. Quote, for China, the study estimates public support for industry to add up to at least 1.71 trillion yuan, equivalent to about 221.3 billion euros at nominal exchange rates, or 1.73% of GDP in 2019, even when applying a conservative methodology and counting only quantifiable factors. This is far higher than estimated support in the other leading economies in the sample, both in absolute terms and as a percentage of GDP. Relative to GDP, public support is about three times higher in China than in France, 0.55%, and about four times higher than in Germany, 0.41%, or the United States, 0.39%. In absolute terms, Germany and France government support amounts to 14.3 billion and 13.3 billion euros respectively, broadly one sixteenth of the level of support in China. End quote. 
zooming into EVs specifically, according to the study, China's BYD Co., their massive electric vehicle giant, received at least 3.4 billion euros, 3.7 billion US dollars, in direct government subsidies as part of Beijing's push to dominate electric vehicles and other clean technologies. Aid for China's leading EV maker jumped 220 million euros in 2020 to 2.1 billion euros only two years later. BYD also is benefiting from support from local battery manufacturers and rebates for buyers of its cars, according to the report. However, this week, Wang Wentao, China's commerce minister, in a speech in Paris, called accusations of industrial overcapacity groundless. The minister, who was attending a roundtable meeting with Chinese EV enterprises in Europe, expressed, quote, China's electric vehicle companies are competitive due to the innovation of technology and comprehensiveness of its supply chain network. The Chinese government will fully support and defend the rights of the industry because our electric vehicle development has made important contributions to the process of the world's green transitioning, end quote. US-based Politico, reporting on the comments, writes that the minister's defense comes at a critical moment in the expansion of Chinese EVs in global markets, especially in Europe. He criticized the EU's protectionist stance and urged for a fair evaluation of China's industrial practices, suggesting that allegations of overcapacity misconstrue the nature of globalized trade and the evolution of supply chains. There are other concerns too. UK-based The Financial Times reports that some car industry executives said Chinese car makers were not selling their vehicles in Europe as fast as they expected, which was a major contributor to the glut at the region's ports. Quote, Chinese EV makers are using ports like car parks, end quote, one car supply chain manager reportedly told the outlet. The piece adds that some Chinese brand EVs have been sitting in European ports for up to 18 months. While some ports have asked importers to provide proof of onward transport, according to industry executives. One car logistics expert said many of the uploaded vehicles were simply staying in the ports until they were sold to distributors or end users. Meanwhile, top business leader and European Chamber of Commerce head Jörg Wotka gave an exclusive interview to Hong Kong-based South China Morning Post this week. The entire interview, which discusses at length the political issues stemming from the economic relationship, is worth a read. Here we will examine a short excerpt. Quote, At this stage, China does not create enough jobs in Europe. Its market is really not matching the openness of our home market. The European Chamber has a position paper with more than 1,000 items of unresolved issues in China, and the number is growing instead of shrinking. EU exports to China are going down from an already very small basis. The EU's exports to China in 2022 were just 23% more than China's into Switzerland. So, is the Chinese market really only 23% bigger than the Swiss market? EU business in China is still not investing enough. Given this market's potential, we could do so much more with the investment of Europe and China. Real annual EU companies' investment is still less than 10 billion US dollars per year, which is pretty much what EU companies invest in Texas annually. End quote. What's more, according to a survey by the German Chamber of Commerce in China released on Wednesday, two-thirds of German companies operating in China say they face unfair competition in the market, a problem that threatens to push up their costs and erode profit margins. The report comes on the eve of German Chancellor Olaf Scholz's trip to China. Scholz will arrive in Chongqing tomorrow, Sunday, and will visit a hydrogen facility operated by a German company before traveling on Monday to Shanghai, where he'll deliver a speech. The German leader, who's making his second trip to China as Chancellor, will then meet Xi Jinping and Premier Li Qiang for political talks in Beijing on Tuesday. To end today, we will examine comments made this week by Noah Barkin, senior advisor in Rhodium Group's China practice based in Berlin, in his Watching China in Europe publication about this upcoming Schultz trip. Quote, Chancellor Schultz will travel to the PRC in mid-April with a 12-strong business delegation in tow. I am told that a deal will be announced to resume German pork exports to the PRC. They were halted in 2020 due to African swine fever. But business deals of the kind that were announced on the French President Emmanuel Macron's visit last April are unlikely. They don't dare cozy up to Xi like Macron did, a person involved in preparations for the trip told me. It would create a storm within the German government, and Schultz would be vilified in the media, they said. 
A Schultz visit to Volkswagen's local operations to celebrate the 40th anniversary of the carmaker's joint venture with state-owned Chinese firm SAIC has been envisioned. But with the controversy over Volkswagen's presence in Xinjiang at a boiling point, I was told this idea was scrapped. What Schultz says or does not say about economic ties and the European Commission's EV probe will also be closely watched. It is important that China hears that we too have concerns about the trade relationship, a German diplomat told me. They can't just hear this from the Commission or from France, they said. But German business has been urging the Schultz team to play down concerns about Chinese overcapacities and focus instead on securing better conditions for German firms in the Chinese market. We may not be able to stop the Commission from imposing duties on Chinese cars, but we can send the Chinese a message that Germany is pushing to limit their scope. The person preparing the trip said. The German leader is also expected to confront Xi with what European diplomats say is rising evidence of Chinese military equipment being used on the battlefield in Ukraine. End quote. Okay, that is today's episode of China Update. Once again, my apologies for my voice. Hopefully I'll be feeling better by Monday. Thank you very much for watching. Have a great weekend and I will see you all again for more China Update on Monday.